to talk today is on um, science and spirituality. So if we can give him a round of applause. Yes, good evening, friends. <clears throat> you see, if we have any system where the different parts of the system do not sit well with each other, that system will be disjointed, it can cause confusion, it can create friction. And this is the society that we live in. In a way, this is because of, if like a sad legacy of Wittgenstein's teaching, which suggested that it is possible to have some you know, variety of different self-consistent system with their own truth claims which can coexist with each other and perhaps you don't need to reconcile. Now you see this may have been okay with me, but I don't think Wittgenstein meant this to be you know, acceptable. It should be possible to reconcile variety of different systems at a deeper level. And the disjoint <coughs> that we face at the moment is as follows. You see, the greatest disjoint we have in modern society, and this is my experience, I go to lots of sixth form seminars and do teachings and so on in philosophy, and I ask the youngsters, um, first question I ask is, how many atheists, how many agnostics, how many truly believers in the religion? Now, at the, up to the age of about 15, majority will put their hands up because they mistakenly think that belonging to a tradition means they believe in that, that's their religion, so they take their names. But the age of 16 to 18, they start to move away. And vast majority, when I say vast majority, sometimes 90% of the youngsters, 16 to 18 age year, age, age, year, age group, now call themselves either atheist or agnostic. This is reality. So the youth are showing their displeasure of religion or the status quo of religion by moving away from their religion in droves. Doesn't matter whether they're Hindu or a Christian or whatever. They're moving away from their religion. This is the biggest disjoint that we face. A disjoint which is kind of in a way of saying that there is a multitude of religious worldviews, that can, we can put them on one side, and there is this, if you like, a more science-oriented, rationally founded, popularly called secular worldview on the other side. And it is time for <coughs> us to recognize that majority of youngsters now fall into the second category. This produces the biggest disjoint regarding a spiritual and a secular worldview. Now, you see, unless you address the issue, as I said, wherever you put any system where different parts don't sit well together, it is going to create confusion, conflict, and problems. And this is what we face. If you open the newspaper, you see straight away the two issues that continue to kind of appear in the newspaper is strife in the name of religion, means even the different religious worldviews can't sit well together with each other, trying to, point, uh, to score points on each other, so you can see if you like a disjoint kind of dictating society and interfering with the working of the society. So it is crucial for thinkers to try and address this demarcation between a secular and a spiritual worldview. And this is what I wish to do in the next 40 minutes. And after that, of course, I'm open to questions and they can be challenging and pointed questions. And I'm quite open to that. I'm used to that. So first of all, let me begin the journey by looking at the religious angle. Now what I'm presenting you may find quite unusual because this is not standard rhetoric you get from people from, of people of religion. And this is what I'm suggesting. Despite appearances, normally religions are, tr are considered to be, if you like, nothing more than a belief system. And it's purely hypothesis really. We have to live on the hypothesis. This is the standard view of religions, that belief is the central word. And science-oriented worldview says, experience, if you like, empirical evidence is our foundation. So there seems to be a disjoint. But really when you look at the religious enterprise, and if you really quiz the theologians or the philosophers of any religion, and really quiz them hard, and say, how can you be sure about your enterprise? How can you be sure about this God chap? Vast majority of them, you see, I'm just exploring this idea of how do you address the demarcation between, if you like, a popularly called secular worldview, which is science-oriented, rationally founded, and a multitude, not just, but multitude of religious worldviews. How can you possibly remove this demarcation or find a reconciliation? Because unless you find a reconciliation, this division or this divisive system is going to create friction in society. And this century and this decade, this issue has to be resolved. Because at the moment, science is winning in a major way, and in fact, almost telling people of religion, we're going to snuff you out. You are the problem and not the resolution of the human condition. We'd rather snuff you out. This is reality. In majority of youth I come across, you know, especially in sixth forms, etc., 
are telling me very clearly, sometimes 90%, they'd rather be an atheist or an agnostic than a person subscribing to a religious point of view. And then we've got multitude of religious worldviews, so they can straightway challenge us saying that, look, you guys first sort yourself out. You've got different religions. Some religions have one god, some have many, some have no god like Buddhism. So why don't you first sort yourselves out, guys? You can't, all of you can't be right. So sort yourselves out first. Play one religion against another. Straight away comes as a challenge. This can't be right. So I'm going to begin my journey by looking at examining the deeper aspects to religion. And I might make many of you shudder because I'm going to look at the deeper aspects of religion in this might involving jettisoning some of the ploys used by religion around which religions are woven. And I might jettison them and so you might make you feel a bit rattled. But so be it. If you are really trying to address this issue of removing the demarcation, you may have to jettison some of the ploys that have been parading in the name of religion, and you may also have to jettison some stuff that appears in the name of science. Now you say, I can talk about science because my background is science, and I have tremendous love for the integrity of science. <coughs> so I'm not here to undermine science, and I'm not here to undermine religions either, and yet you see how I'm trying to address this issue of reconciling this variety of different worldviews. Let's begin with the religions. When you really quiz the people of religion saying, how can you be sure? I mean, they'll give you all sorts of cosmological argument and teleological argument and uh, argument based on miracles and scriptures, you know, revelation. All this will fall by the wayside. You can, you can you know, easily show the weaknesses of all these particular aspects. It doesn't prove. When you really push, that, push them hard, push them in the corner until the people begin to squeak, a theologian will say, well, I don't know, but this man said so. And he'll point at somebody, a prophet of that religion, or a sage or a seer of that religion. Say, he said so, and I'm just prepared to go along with him, because his life is so exciting and so interesting, I'm prepared to go along with the enterprise, because he said so. Now, when you look at this person or this prophet of every world religion, see, something happened to them, and this was very experiential. This was not a belief. They did not suddenly discover a belief system or intellectualize, had cups of coffee and worked it out. They actually had an encounter of the first kind, if I can use the language. It seemed to have changed their lives for the better. And seems to change the life of anybody who goes near them. And yet they are talking different languages. So how can you have so many religions? What's going on? Let me give you a Hindu input in this. This is pure esoteric Hinduism. This is not standard Hinduism. This is what I'm suggesting. Look, you have to agree with me, I'm, making, I'm very clear about my language. I'm suggesting, I am saying, at the experiential level, every prophet, every sage, every seer of any religion, every religion, hit the same jackpot. They had the same experience. And they were struggling to give expression to this experience because they said this experience is beyond words. It is an ah thing, we can't put it in words. So they've all been complaining, saying it's transcendent. That's the language they use, transcendent. We don't have words to describe our experience. And yet that is the foundation of all of our, all of our, our activities, our belief system. We had a fantastic transcendent experience and we can't put it in words. And what do they do, do next? They do exactly that. They try and put it in words. So after this experience, they open their mouths and try and interact with the greater society to try and present this idea of this if like this very highly personal experience, so they will open their mouths and give expression to this experience. So far, so good. Now, every time they open their mouths to give expression, what tools they have? Of course, the language they are using, the mindset in which they operate, and the mindset of the society in which they are operating. It cannot be otherwise. They will always use the language, the mindset of their, their own mindset as well as the mindset of the, the people they are interacting. They are very keen to infuse what they have experienced into greater society. So they will use the only tool they have, this, commun if you like, this common thing that we possess <coughs> called language, to give expression to their experience. So what I am suggesting, I said I will make you, some of you shudder as, as we go along. That when Christ goes into the wilderness and comes back, and tries to give expression to what he has experienced. Suppose he said, I had this transcendent experience, you know, with beyond words. The people said, well, go away then, don't waste our time. He has to use the language the people can understand, because he's, you see, he's in love with humanity. He has seen the greater unity which links him with the rest of humanity. So he's prepared, he's going to go out of his way to use any tool at his, at his, at his you know, mercy and make sure this idea of spirit is fused, infused in the society in which he interacts. So they will open, he say, ah, 
You see, I've seen the Father in heaven. And people say, yeah, that makes sense. We have fathers and fathers are nice and benevolent and look over our shoulder and guide us and look after us. And this heaven spirit, see, he will use that language. When Buddha goes and sits under the Bodhi tree and comes out an enlightened person, I'm suggesting same experience given different expression. He does not refer to a theos. There's no God. He doesn't mention a God at all. He said, I feel enlightened. The way to resolve the human condition is for all of us, whole of humanity to feel enlightened, to recognize what is the nature of reality. And that's the way you, you, you kind of you know, become spiritual. So again, you see, I'm saying the same experience given different expression, producing, if you like, variation of different religious movements. So far, so good still. You see, I'm just showing you a variation. I'm trying to find a reconciliation between multitude, multitude of religious worldviews. I'm just suggesting. Just play along with me for the time. Maybe you can then tear me up. So I'm saying the same experience, when given expression, turns into different religions. Still is so far okay. Then the theologians move in. <coughs> Because they have realized that their prophet is talking something that's very delicate. This is a fledgling plant which can do great benefit. It can be very beneficial for the society. They are well-meaning people. So the church fathers and all the various theologians, various religions get gather together and try and protect this fledgling plant by putting in lots of sets of doctrines and dogmas to protect the little fledgling plant. The intentions are good. But the moment you put up a barrier to protect something, it becomes divisive. It starts dividing humanity, those who are inside and those who are outside. These will go to heaven, these will go to hell. We start producing a divisive system. So when, forget about giving expression which is going to be very, you know, variable. Once you try and interpret it or give it, if you like, this kind of expression through doctrines and dogma, then it becomes downright divisive. That is why we have conflict in the name of religion. Because they are all trying to, you know, somehow score points against each other. And this becomes a divisive system. It was not intended to be, it was a well-meaning idea, and yet it turns into a divisive system. Now you see, the greatest thinkers like Russell, etc., Hume, etc., have criticized world religions for this reason. They say, the reason why religions become counterproductive for the greater society is because of monotheism. This idea that we conjured up of a, if you like, a, this great super personality is overlooking, uh, overlooking, our overlooking over our shoulder and guiding us, etc., has become, if you like, seriously counterproductive. It creates fanatic behavior in society. Monotheism, they pointed the finger at. And there is a reason why it is true. I mean, you see in present day, if you open the newspaper, this is the first thing that hit you. It is monotheism that creates this tremendous division in society, and chaos and problem. Why does monotheism arise in the first place? Let us explore that. And what I am now leading to now, esoteric Hinduism, moving away from theistic Hinduism into non-theistic Hinduism. Let me take you on the journey. This is what I am suggesting. Essentially, we know this idea of the spirit as something that you have an encounter of, you know, this, this, this first an encounter of the spirit, or the idea that you see some, a deeper nature of reality is more marvelous. What is it actually? Esoteric Hinduism says, this is not something that's external to you. In a way, this is in a way reflecting your own inner dimension, <coughs> your own spiritual dimension. What you were searching for in the name of God in the highest heaven as an invisible being in an invisible plane is your essential nature. So you say, well, I didn't know that. You see, the aspect that kind of becomes revealed in every living thing and becomes more clearly visible in human beings, what are these aspects? Just let's classify them. We seem to have, if you like, an endearing aspect to all of us, it makes us compassionate, but it's very, not very perhaps grandly compassionate, but little compassionate. We like the people around us, perhaps our friends and our family members, and this seems to be trickling through. We are also inquisitive by nature and we are searching for knowledge. We seem to have natural affinity to acquire knowledge and be knowledgeable. Third thing, this is a unique feature about every living thing, perhaps the biologists can learn from here. That when you try and define a living thing, what's the speciality of a living thing? So all, yes, all the various ploys you use in your biology lessons, defining a living thing, will actually fall short. 
And it's a very tricky thing to define a living thing. Esoteric Hinduism says the way you define a living thing from a non-living thing is this. The thing that is living is always in defiance of natural forces and physical forces. It's never, not in compliance. It always stands up against it, hates it. So if you try and prod it, it will say no. It will stand up against you. It won't roll over and play dead. This is the idea of a living thing. It does not comply with physical forces. It's in defiance of it. This is the way the Hindus define a living thing. It's very interesting. So what I'm saying is, the, the living thing is that which does not like being buffeted, being pushed about. In fact, I did a kind of funny quip at Warwick University. I said, you see, how do you distinguish a living thing? I said, suppose you're walking and you see a piece of rock and you are in the mood to play rugby and you want to practice. So you might decide to give a kick to this piece of rock and being a physicist, of course, you can work out its trajectory to the nearest millimeter. You're very good at that. Suppose you see a dog. Now, you see, I'm a mild-mannered Hindu, not advocating violence against animals. Suppose you see a dog and you suddenly feel that, come on, let's go for it. And suppose you try to, you know, test your, you know, rugby skills. One thing you can be certain is you will not be able to work out the trajectory of the dog very likely to go for your leg. <laughs> this is the difference. I'm lightening up a very serious issue. If you look at Fitzroy Capra, he defines living thing in that which is always in a way fighting against natural forces. It's always standing up against natural forces. And this is the right way. He said, if you disturb a living thing, you see, at best you can, you know, kind of, you can't prod it, but you can disturb it. It'll go, ouch. Simple way of defining a <coughs> living thing. It doesn't like to be pushed about. To become empowered is a unique feature about living things. You see, the reason why we are not sitting naked, huddled up in a chaos, hungry and thirsty and shivering at the mercy of the forces of nature, <coughs> but you put these forces of nature in wires, lit up this place, and sitting comfortably here, shows, if you like, the culmination of this process of becoming empowered. We don't like to be buffeted by forces of nature. We harness them, put them in wires, and then sit on top of them. This is a living thing, becoming empowered. So I'm just looking at the endearing aspect of all human beings. I'm telling you, this is, if you like, the spiritual underpinning revealing itself to us, our own spiritual underpinning. What is it? Compassion, search for knowledge, becoming empowered. Ah, unknowingly, we are in a way reflecting our underpinning, which is spiritual too, as I said. This is esoteric Hinduism. You are essentially that what you were searching for in the heaven. And it is revealing itself through these things. So what does monotheism do? It has a marvelous trick. It exaggerates these features, these human features, compassion, knowledge, empowerment, exaggerates it to infinite and plonks it onto one chap called God. And then says, okay, now for me to be religious, I must reflect these qualities. So if I'm little compassionate, oh, oh, that's not good enough. I must be more compassionate so that God will be happy with me. I can get closer to my, this infinite super person that I've just created. So we create an exaggerated human being with the endearing aspect of human qualities, not all aspects of humanity. In fact, in the ancient scriptures, in the Hebrew scriptures, as well as the Hindu scriptures, the God was sometimes violent and vicious and vindictive. Because they were exaggerating the human features, on, 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 uh, the baser human features as well. But then we become more sophisticated. So, no, 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 not that part. The good part. <coughs> Compassion and power and knowledge. Ex exaggerated to infinite. Plonk it on that fellow saying, God, you are all that. And by doing this, what is my benefit? In order for me to build relationship with him, I must reflect these qualities in my life. And that's called religious living. See? This is how religions have survived for a few thousand years. They, you see, the Hindus say, God has not created us in his image. We create God in our image. God we just created is an exaggerated human with good qualities, only good qualities. And then how does it fall flat? The moment you have a tsunami, the whole thing collapses. You say, you know, Jeremy Wine asked me on Radio 2 program, Mr. Lakani, what was your God doing when the tsunami struck? Was he having a siesta? These poor people have done nothing wrong. Why do you kill millions, hundreds of thousands? Why? No, where do you get answer? Now you see, the thing is this. 
is we have created this super personality, this exaggerated human and now we say why, what were you doing? And the answer comes from that super personality saying look you created me like this. you sorted it out. I am just showing you. This is a ploy, a human ploy, an anthropologic ploy <coughs> in order to, for us to reveal our spiritual dimension to a greater extent we create this super, if you like this exaggerated human with